do want to get though quickly to the future of nuclear war. I heard you, Leslie, on an interview with uh, where you were co-interviewed with Jerry Brown and Governor Jerry Brown was talking about how asleep at the wheel uh, American politicians are where it comes to nuclear war. And you were talking about, Leslie, how you were a child of the 80s and you wrote a letter to Gorbachev and to Ronald Reagan. Yeah. And I, when I was a baby, I think one of the first protests I went to was about nuclear uh, war, no nukes. Where are we in that? Where's the doomsday clock? Why are people so casual about nuclear war? Uh, how is this playing out in the war, uh, the Ukraine war? Well, I mean, if you're looking at, you know, the bulletin of the atomic scientists and their, their famous doomsday clock, they're saying that we're not doing so hot right now. I mean, right, right now we're, we're, we're pretty close to, to midnight, which is, you know, apocalypse. Um, they currently have it set as of January 2023 to 90 seconds to midnight, and it was never set that close to midnight in the depth of the Cold War. Um, David and I can talk a little bit more about you know, the bulletin and the evolution of the doomsday clock. Um, but you know, look, the, the bulletin clock is, is also it's, it's tied up with existential threat, and, and you know, climate change is a factor in that. Obviously, um, you know, things got more perilous in their eyes uh, with you know, with countries uh, withdrawing from international treaties with North Korea, safer rattling, um, uh, and especially really, you know, the, the danger accelerated um, in their mind and in the public's mind, I think, with Russian invasion of Ukraine last, last March or last February or last March, um, you know, and for the first time, you know, we really saw a viable threat from a nuclear superpower to use nuclear weapons in warfare, which hasn't happened since August 9th, 1945, with the with the bombing of Nagasaki. And um, you know, when you talk to nuclear watchdogs about what was happening, you know, in in, in those days where where Putin was really making very bold threats, you know, they say you know they were really scared. They were they were preparing to put out statements about you know this first breaking of, of nuclear of the nuclear taboo as they call it um and so you know, we it does seem that we are in a in a more perilous situation than, than we have been for, for quite some time um if there's any silver lining to it, it we do have increased awareness about the nuclear threat um especially among generations who have grown up assuming that it evaporated chris nolan's old kid told him, you know, why are you making a movie about, about nukes? Nobody thinks about that anymore. Um, but this is the threat that never went away. And if anything, it has accelerated, you know, very significantly. Um, and again, no matter what you think about Chris Nolan's interpretation, he has heightened awareness. We're talking about this right now. Otherwise, we might be talking about Trump's mugshots on today's, today's show. Well, not, um, not on my so, show, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so... So that's that's my my two cents on the the topic. I mean, I'm inclined. I, I think both of your um, research and writing. I've read pieces that are talk about current events much more than my own does. So I want to sort of largely, um, you know, defer to you guys on this. What one thing that I, that we'll just throw in, and this is largely something that I reflect on less from my research and just from my own teaching, right? You know, about this is that. I mean, I'm also a child of the 80s and I grew up thinking about like nuclear, I mean, you, 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 I, I, I mean, I, I remember not being allowed to see the day after, right? Because it was judged to be too scary for how, you know, however old I was at the time. Um, and I, I remember thinking of nuclear war as the existential threat, right? But now mm -hmm. it of course competes for that, right? With other kinds of threats and not that like, pandemics and climate change are exactly the same kind of threat. They're not, you know, but I think that that's one of the things that I think makes it, it's not just the passing of the Cold War, it's the competition both in like real space and media space for like, well, I mean, like how, how many looming disasters does it, can an attention span hold, right? Right, right a nuclear, I think, competes now with other things for the hundred percent yeah david i agree with you wholeheartedly i think you know there's also just you know in this particular moment you know quasi post-pandemic because you know seeing surges again but post-pandemic you know in in the depths of uh 
of climate change where we're seeing the hottest summer on record, we're seeing catastrophic yeah. storms and flooding. And it's like, how much can people, how much existential threat can people take? Yeah. And so now you know, there's heightened awareness about like, oh, guess what? This threat never went away and we're going to be spending, you know, $1.2 trillion just developing our own nuclear arsenal for the next 30 years. Like yeah. how do people, how does the average citizen or a you know, civilian have the bandwidth to to contend with that. And I think that's actually one of the, the huge challenges of you know uh, journalists and, and watchdogs who cover the nuclear space is to um, to get people to to care because they, they feel not not because they're not concerned with nuclear threat, you know, whether it, it, it's because they, they feel so removed from the ability to tackle something so enormous. You know, with climate change you can eat less beef buy an electric car like, what are you supposed to do about nuclear threat um and you know so that has to do with the enormity of the problem and some of it just really has to do with what you, what you said bandwidth emotional fatigue uh you know it's, it's it seems to me to be um, a uniquely trying period of time to to take take all of that in i'll, I'll just say on on this that i mean i've i've done a lot of work and thinking about how to engage with publics and how to get them what, what kinds of techniques work best with modern young people in particular? Because they're the, uh, th there's a tremendous, the, the disappointing thing is that young people have not been thinking about nuclear weapons as much. The upshot is they're actually quite interested in, in these threats. And so the question is, how do you harness that interest? They don't have strong ingrained positions already. And that's an opportunity that you don't necessarily have with all generations. But I, I will say for me, just to bring it back to the Oppenheimer film a little bit, like, will this get people talking in a way that makes them feel like it's an issue or feel empowered to be a political, something they want to ask their representatives about? I don't know. I'm a little doubtful. I think a lot of the money that went for this was one, Nolan, and two, Barbie. I think the Barbenheimer thing was for real and gaining a lot of attention, which I liked Barbie a lot. It was great. But like, um, <laughs> I don't know like if it'll, if people will leave. I was talking with a, somebody the other day who was a weapons guy. He's a retired weapons administrator guy. And he said that he saw Strangelove in Dr. Strangelove originally in the 60s. And he and his friends had to leave the movie and get a drink afterwards. And like, I don't know too many people who left Oppenheimer and were like, wow, let's think about the deep issues that were involved. I could be wrong. I'm not the target demographic of this movie, but I'm just not sure. So to me, that'll be the interesting referendum on whether or not this movie has a longer impact. Do I, This is how I end my piece that I wrote on it. Like, will I'm it have more impact than just Barbie? Uh, and I don't know. And I'm not saying that to down play bar to trivialize barbie but like that's that was sort of the barbenheimer thing was a big part of why talking but the one thing i am a little bit more optimistic about and we'll see i don't know what the answer is but but i'm a little more optimistic is with oppenheimer and hbo chernobyl from a couple of years ago these are not things that you would necessarily if you were pitching them in hollywood expect big audiences for like hey you want to watch a mini series about a ukrainian soviet reactor disaster everybody dies in the end right do you want to watch a really sad long movie about the father of the atomic bomb and how insecure he is like probably not right like and yet these are both fantastically successful and so my hope is that this will there's a i i've had, talked to a lot of people who work in like hollywood writing and producing and they will constantly say in media like oh nobody wants to buy nuke stuff and like i don't think that's actually true at all i don't think that's true in the slightest but like that's the received wisdom in the entertainment industry and my hope is that maybe these things will change that received wisdom that's my optimism there has to be a nuke barbie yeah. nuclear barbie right. On that, on that note, I'm getting advertised an Instagram shirt that says, you know, in Barbie font, yeah. now I am, you know, destroyed. Yeah, so, I got you know, one so of them. Like, yeah. <laughs> I can't <laughs> wait to see that. You know, Alex, I have to say, though, to your point, though, about just being, you know, people go out and, and have the sobering drink afterwards. You know, look, I, I, I went out and I had the drink after Dunkirk. I was rattled the hell by that, okay? So, and then, but I, I wouldn't go out personally, if you know, even if, if, I, if I were not steeped in the world that we are steeped in of nuclear threat. I would not have gone out and had the drink. And do you know why? It's because they did not show the consequences of the bomb in the movie. Now, if we had seen what this bomb does to, to human beings, if we had seen the destruction, you know, that we're up against. And let's not 
let's not forget Hiroshima and Trinity were dinky bombs. They were dinky bombs a year later. They've just been recategorized as low yield nukes. Um, you know, so I, I think that again, it's that's that's the missed opportunity that we were talking about at the beginning to come full circles. You know, we if you're, if you're creating movie. You know, again, I know it's a biopic. I know it's exploring the, the inner terrain of a complicated man, but I mean, he's not just any complicated man, okay? Like Donald Draper like, went and made the Coke commercial afterwards. That was his big, his big you know, contribution. Oppenheimer created the world-destroying bomb. We didn't see the consequences of it, so we don't go and have the drink afterwards. Who knows how much longer journalists like me or, you know, nuclear advocates, uh, nuclear threat uh, watchdogs, um, are even going to be able to capitalize on the the brouhaha surrounding on Oppenheimer. Yeah. I mean, in this community, you know, everybody thinks, okay, well, you know, we have a month after the release, and then over the season, it will come up again. So there'll be two blocks of opportunity to talk about this issue. We'll do another panel. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> There's a quote from one of your pieces, David, that made me think that, you know, when, 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 um, Alex, you were saying, why does um, Nolan care about this? Why did he write about this? But you wrote, um, David, he never questions its use in World War II and quickly fell in line with the need to develop additional weapons after 1945. American audiences, both those in the mid 20th century and those who have just seen Nolan's film can therefore easily admire Oppenheimer's morality without needing to rethink anything about their country's foreign policy. I mean, that is, I mean, I think I wrote that like in the days after the movie and it's still more or less what I, what I think. Well, well, I've said that I don't think that that Oppenheimer you were describing is what I think of as like, it's, it's not my Oppenheimer or Alex said it's not his Oppenheimer. I don't think seeing that Oppenheimer is really being duped or tricked because those are real parts of who he was, hmm. right? Part of the reason that people keep coming back to him is that he is, was chameleon-like and that he had, he gave genuinely the reason it works and the reason he can be portrayed as a martyr, right, or portrayed as an ethical scientist is because he gave genuinely, like, eloquent and right. heartfelt witness to some of the ethical questions, right? And so I think that 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 person that Nolan is portraying is real and is part of who Oppenheimer was. I don't think it defined his actions after the during or after the war but i don't but i think he was so like i mean it's, this is such a stereotype in biographies but i think it's actually really true of oppenheimer is that so contradictory that you can see the oppenheimer nolan tells is i don't think it's wrong it's just partial right but it's real yeah, yeah. It's kind of, I'm realizing like, it's kind of an identity politics tile yeah. too. My guard was so lowered. It's like, there's this Jewish communist scientist <laughs> who really is afraid of the Nazis and wants to cooperate with the Soviets. Like what's more lovable than that? Right. Yeah. I mean, not, not everyone has that. Obviously. <laughs> no, That's no. not everyone's type, but uh, yeah. But, but to David's <laughs> point, I mean, what, what the historians call Oppenheimer complicated and what they mean is inconsistent, right? Yeah. Like what we mean is he doesn't fit into, and he definitely doesn't fit into like simple modern political molds, which is one of the dangers of reading those back into him. The whole atomic bomb decision doesn't fit into those. Like the right. biggest critics of the atomic bomb were conservatives in the forties, right? Like things have flipped around and really complicated ways i will just say for one thing and this comes around to, to what both of you have been saying especially david about the, the foreign policy question like why do we tell this story in this country why are people so invested in the truman and the bomb question right like you can go to random people on the street and say why did truman drop the bomb and my god they will have a strong opinion and if you tell them it didn't happen that way they'll be like no i'm right and they'll fight it even though yeah. they themselves probably like watched one thing on the history channel about it had one conversation in high school about it right like they don't research this they don't stop and the answer is, whereas they don't do this for all aspects of american history right i can go in there and ask them about something the berlin wall crisis they don't have strong opinions about that even if they know about it right and it's because it's one of these foundational narratives to how we think about the United States, its morality as an actor in the world, its justifications for policy, this, this whole question of like, is it okay to burn 100,000 civilians if 
we're saving a million lives. Like that's how we frame this question. And it's not about the past. It's about the future. And to me, this is why it's so important to go in there and show that it's actually more complicated than that, because you're not just like shaping people's understanding of the past. You're, you're going to people and saying, you know, this moral parable you carry around about the United States, I'm not telling you it's just 100% wrong or whatever. I'm just saying it's always more complicated than that. You're never going to have a situation where you have like two paths in front of you and one does this and one does that. And like you have to act as if you don't have that situation. So for me, it's like a imperative of historians who work on this to do that intervention because it's not just about 1945. It's about the next war. It's about the right. next, it's about justifying whether you keep nuclear weapons around at all. What are those conditions? Right. And, and there's something, the other part of the, of the, of the, or the, another part, maybe the other part of the, of the, the moral question here is focusing on that. And Leslie, you were like gesturing to this before, but like focusing on the atomic bomb or the atomic bombs, distracts attention from all the other bombings that happened before that, right? And so somehow there's something like, I've always been fascinating by the way that the, the ethical questions around bombing in World War II always center on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, right? And so it's as if by debating whether or not that was something we sh- the U.S. should have done, we've implicitly said everything else is fine, right? The right. only question to ask is, did Hiroshima or Nagasaki cross the line? Right. No one you really talks about Dresden, for instance. Right. Right. You know, and that's, I mean, I don't, I'm not, I don't. I don't pretend to know a ton about Dresden or even the firebombing of Tokyo, but yeah. I do think if we're going to talk about ethics and weapon building and war, those things should be on the table too. Yeah. 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 Well, this has been great. I want to leave you guys with one quote, the audience with one quote that I actually found on from a, your, one of your articles, Alex. You quote the U.S. Strategic Bombing Survey, a military-led assessment of bombing effectiveness in World War II, which concluded in July 1946 that based on a detailed investigation of all the facts and supposed by the testimony of the surviving Japanese leaders involved, it is the survey's opinion that certainly prior to 31 December 1945, and in all probability prior to 1 November 1945, Japan would have surrendered even if the atomic bombs had not been dropped, even if Russia had not entered the war, and even if no American invasion had been planned or contemplated. So... To, to be sure, those people were justifying firebombing. So like this is, again, the complicated. <laughs> right. They were basically saying, who won the war? The people dropping napalm won the war, not these other things. And okay, so yeah. I'm not saying they're wrong. I'm not saying they're right. I'm just yeah, saying they, they have their own motivation. Everybody has a motivation. There's no right. neutral take on it. And right. uh, But it's an interesting. And also, but just to highlight one thing, November 1st is when the invasion would have started. So, like, that's why that's an important date for them to note. So they're saying, right. like, well before the invasion, it would have been. But, you right. know, who knows?